the whole idea behind sleep is that we do a couple things. We rest the body, uh, but we also get into a deep enough sleep where we rest our brains and our brains actually get a chance to detoxify. If you're in a deep enough sleep, it's called non-REM level three sleep. You know, you're not dreaming. You're actually out cold, basically. Your brain cells actually shrink and then cerebral spinal fluid can flow through the brain and clean the brain up. It's important to get four or five hours of that every single night. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode. And today's guest is Reed Davis. He's the founder of the Functional Diagnostic Nutrition, and he serves as a health director and case manager at the Wellness Center in Southern California. California, and it's been over 10 years, um, and we're so excited to have you. Welcome, Reed. Well, thanks so much for helping me. I hope we can provide some good information that's actionable to your viewers and uh, audience. Awesome. Um, well, sometimes people say, what's the biggest difference in functional diagnostic nutrition and seeing a, quote, regular doctor? What do you tell them? It's a great question. And of course, regular doctors are wonderful and they save a lot of lives and uh, they're great to have around when you need one. And uh, the difference though is that they generally diagnose and treat disease or manage disease. And they generally do it with drugs and surgery and things like that. So they're, they're absolutely great at intervening when a person has a real fast downward spiral in health, you know, you need to go see a doctor. At the same time, we all know that they don't really look for underlying causes and conditions. And there's not enough of them doing that anyway. And there's not enough of them doing the anti-aging. And uh, they definitely don't teach you what to do to maintain health. So generally, we find people going to doctors with a health complaint. And often they've had it for many years and they just get something for the symptoms like how, you know, and, and they're, they're not happy with that. People today are actually willing to do a little work. You know, they're asking, what can I do to uh, where I don't have to see a doctor? And that's, that's where we come in, you know, with education and all the things. I mean, I've spent 20 years kind of sorting that out. What can people do? And everyone knows I love a great acronym, and you have a great one called Dress for Success um, Health Program. And can you just kind of explain what is Dress and what does it stand for? Absolutely. And you know, you mentioned in my brief bio there that I spent ten years managing a clinic, and I was the case manager, so every single person had to see me. And what started all this was actually at the very beginning when people walking in our door of our clinic, it really frustrated me that they'd already seen five or six or more practitioners, and yet they still had their complaint, and it, it just didn't make any sense to me. Now, I might have been pretty naive, naive at the time, but I decided I would be the last person they needed to see. And so, fortunately, I had a lot of really good mentors, and I was on this quest, and I learned to run the lab work first. So before we do the dress protocol, we usually have fully assessed the person's condition, like underlying conditions. And again, these are not things doctors are looking for. We're, we're looking for imbalances within the hormones, the immune system, digestion, detoxification, you know, your basic functions. And we see healing opportunities there. We see, hey, this could be improved. And believe me, it doesn't show up on blood work that your doctor's doing. That's why when you go see a doctor, you often hear, you look fine, you look normal. And so, but we know you're not, and you know you're not. So once we've assessed, which is the first step, then the DRESS protocol comes in. It's called DRESS for Health Success. It's trademarked because it was so successful, we were granted a trademark. And my, all of my certified practitioners use it. So it stands for diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, and supplementation. So it's a holistic lifestyle program that doesn't treat anything specifically, but it treats everything, every cell in the body, every tissue, every organ, every system. It treats the entire organism, you might say non-specifically. It just helps fix everything. And that way we're not practicing medicine without a license. You know, we're not diagnosing and treating a specific disease, even if you have one. 
We just look for healing opportunities with the labs, and then we apply the health principles encompassed in that dress program. And it took me, you know, a lot of years to figure out what really makes people better. You know, again, I didn't want to just treat their symptoms or awesome. uh, what's called palliative care. Great. Let's jump right into the listener questions. And the first one is from Alex in Virginia Beach. I've had the hardest time falling asleep lately. I wake up every day at 4.30 a.m., so I should be exhausted, and I usually am. I've tried eliminating my afternoon coffee, and I'm only drinking coffee in the morning now, and that hasn't helped. I've also cut out alcohol, and that hasn't helped me either. Once I fall asleep, I sleep like a rock, but I feel exhausted when my 4.30 alarm goes off. What can you recommend to help me sleep that I already haven't mentioned? Are there any supplements I could try? Well, there are some supplements, but uh, before that, you know, we like uh, kava kava. We like melatonin sometimes. We like, um, you know, chamomile tea. We like um, some other things like that, uh, valerian. And there are some herbal things that can relax you. So you basically want to be relaxed, but it could be that there's some unknown or hidden stress factor it is keeping the cortisol high. And this is why we do lab work on our uh, people who aren't sleeping well. And by the way, 4.30 is pretty early, but if you have slept, you know, five or six really good deep hours, you shouldn't be unrefreshed, you know. So the whole idea behind sleep is that we do a couple things. We rest the body, uh, but we also get into a deep enough sleep where we rest our brains, and our brains actually get a chance to detoxify. If you're in a deep enough sleep, it's called non-REM level three sleep. You know, you're not dreaming. You're actually out cold, basically. Your brain cells actually shrink, and then cerebral spinal fluid can flow through the brain and clean the brain up. It's important to get four or five hours of that every single night, or you could wake up unrefreshed or with lots of other problems and eventually even serious health problems in the brain. So um, I'm not telling everyone they need eight hours, but you do need to rest the body and you need to get into a deep enough sleep for long enough to cleanse the brain. Now, by the way, while that's happening, you, the rest of your organs would also detoxify. We know the liver works better, the gallbladder and things like that. Your hormones, like human growth hormone is really important. Uh, that rises while you're asleep, if you're deep enough asleep. So to the gentleman who inquired, 4.30 is pretty early, but if you went to bed early enough and slept soundly enough, you should not be tired. So the, I would probably start checking the various systems like the hormones. Again, stress is ubiquitous. It, it's everywhere, and there's every different kind of stress, and it does affect your cortisol levels. Like cortisol is will suppress melatonin. Cortisol is your stress hormone. It stays high. It tries to keep your blood sugar high, kind of tries to keep other hormones elevated to handle the stress. So you really need to go through some kind of nighttime route of uh, being quiet, uh, getting rid of all of the, like maybe this person's staying up uh, on the computer until 11 o'clock, and then he tries to sleep until 4.30. That's not gonna work. You really need to get into sleep hygiene. And matter of fact, I will send everybody listening if they want a document uh, that we have. It's called the Dress for Health Success Guidebook. And so D-R-E-S-S, it'll have some sleep hygiene tips in there, and I'll be happy to give that to all of your audience. And you need to, you know, follow that. It could include winding down. Now, me as a business owner with 30 employees and, you know, close to 3,000 students in 50 different countries, you might think I have a little bit of stress, and that would be true. But uh, it's, it's the perspective, the point of view that you take. You know, I've always been very thankful and grateful and meditative at times. So what I'll do is, uh, first of all, turn all the lights out. I, I get off my computer like shortly after dinner. I might do dinner and then still do a little work. But, you know, I, you've got to get away from the computer screen and then go to bed. Uh, you know, hydrate your body. Take a little protein snack. A little protein will raise your um, glucagon levels and, and try, it'll help stabilize your blood sugar through the night. And so a little protein snack. 
uh, some sleep, other sleep hygiene, including even uh, what I do is I listen to YouTube on my cell phone. Now they say that shouldn't be near you, but you got to have balance in your life, you know. So I listen to YouTube all the time, uh, and it I just it knocks me right out. Either pick something really boring <laughs> that that puts you out, you know, or you know, like like books, like audio books are fantastic. You can you'll fall asleep. You even can learn while you're asleep if you're listening to meditation. Uh, there's endless meditation um, that will play to your subconscious while you're asleep. I find that very helpful. Um, and lots of other tips in that guidebook. Hey guys, we absolutely love getting your questions into the podcast, but we're also interested in your journey. So if you've started intermittent fasting and have some success or even struggling a little bit, we want to hear about it. Email me your intermittent fasting stories to Chantel at ChantelRayWay.com. Now back to the show. Great. This next question is from Laura in Massachusetts. I have been eating within a six hour window for the past three months or so, and I've been following the 80-20 principle of eating 80% clean foods. I was bummed when I went to the doctor the other day and said my cholesterol was slightly high. My doctor recommended medication, but I'm not ready to take that step. It's not dangerously high, just a little above average. How can I regulate this naturally without medication? Yeah, fantastic. So the first thing I heard was that you eat 80% clean and 20% what? Garbage? <laughs> I mean, don't, don't do that. Get as close to 100% as you can of eating clean. You know, it's a discipline that uh, will pay off down the road. So try not to cheat on a clean diet. And um, like the first gentleman said, he avoids uh, caffeine except in the morning, which is fine. And, uh, and alcohol, that's another really good thing to do. So eating clean means clean organs. The detoxification organs will be clean. And um, I think the question was about cholesterol. And, you know, I'm not a physician, but I've studied cholesterol and the current levels on a blood test that your doctor would do are probably too strict. Like they really don't like the... Uh, the lipoproteins, you know, the the uh, the so-called bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. I think that their their ranges are um, not accurate. What's really important, you you can, in other words, you can have much higher LDLs as long as your HDLs are in proportion to it. So what you really want to do is look at, you know, ask for a copy of the blood work. Don't just take their word for it, and look at your HDL ratio to the total cholesterol. And it should be uh, below four to one ratio or and actually closer to two to one would be really good. So in other words, let's pretend that my total cholesterol was 200, which isn't bad. It might sound a tiny bit high, but 200. But if my HDLs were 100, then I'd have a two to one ratio of total to HDL. Now that's amazing. That means you have a beautiful ratio between HDL and LDL or HDL and total cholesterol. So that's really more important. And it should never fall below four to one. So if your total cholesterol is 200 and your HDLs are only 50, that's a four to one ratio, you see. So you don't want to drop below that. And what you would do is do vigorous exercise and watch your diet, of course. You know, eat the right amount of protein and fat and carbohydrates for your metabolic type, and then you'd be in good shape. So we've actually seen people with cholesterol of 250. Now that's, you know, out of range for sure, according to medicine. But if their HDLs were high enough, like I said, 100, you'd, you'd be at a, you know, 2.5 to 1 ratio. That's, and that's a beautiful ratio. So it's your HDLs you want to have be high. And that requires the right diet, really good liver function, and other things. But that's my answer to that question. I, I would not take the medication myself. Okay, this next question was on Facebook and she didn't tell us where she lived, but um, it says, I wanted your take on celery juice. Does it work miracles like a lot of people claim? Her question is, does, does drinking celery juice break my fast? From Jessica. 
Well, in a, in a way it does, but um, you said she doesn't, she must be from California doing the celery just fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding about that. But um, we find people coming up with all kinds of ways to try to expedite cleansing and uh, celery juice isn't much better than anything else I've seen out there as far as juice fast. So there is such a thing as a juice fast. In other words, all you do is drink juice. And I, I could see doing it once in a while, but generally we're not designed for that. You know, we're designed to eat regular, really high quality, high nutrient density foods and occasionally fast. So unless someone's really trying to lose weight, I wouldn't do a lot of fasting, in which case intermittent fasting is actually a pretty good idea. And intermittent fasting doesn't have to be more than just, um, you know, don't eat certain hours. Like if you only ate between, say, noon, let's say you started the day with a nice breakfast, lunch, you know, brunch kind of thing at noon, uh, then as long as you ate your last meal before 8 p.m., then you would be fasting from 8 p.m. already all, all the way till noon the next day. Now, I wouldn't do that for long, but that would be a decent, what we call an intermittent fast if you wanted to drop a few pounds. And, you know, even I've been in, I've been in the health business for, for 20 years. Before that, I was in environmental law and saving the planet, you know, for the environment and such. But, but um, you know, I've, I've struggled myself occasionally with self-care, with really taking good care of myself. You know, you're so busy teaching and taking care of everyone else. So, you know, you just buckle down and I apply the dress principles to myself, you know, and I'm, I drop, I'm at the right weight and my body's working good. I'm sleeping well. I have lots of energy. Uh, all the, all the pipes work, you know, like, so you need to keep checking yourself and uh, your, you know, your immune system would really be really good. And so celery juice isn't going to really have that big of an effect uh, over a long period of time. Okay, this next question is from Rhonda. Oh, I want to I wanna say something about, let me answer the celery juice for the fasting. So celery juice has about... 40 calories in a glass of celery juice and what we have found with people obviously if you take on any calories then you're quote breaking the fast right because if you're completely fasting um, but what we have found with people if they're doing fasting for weight loss <clears throat> when they do something that's 50 calories or less they still see really great results. So whatever they do that's 50 calories or below, um, it just, they still see amazing results from that. So that's just from different people and different people we've tested. Yes, obviously, anything you drink um, breaks the fast, but if you, if it's less than 50 calories, it's, you know, it's, it's we still see amazing results. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that uh, any calories would break the fast, uh, but you need to stay hydrated. And, yes. and some calories from, from juice uh, would be fine. I don't know if there's any magic in celery juice, but, but um, uh, you know, I wouldn't do it forever. And the other thing to be really concerned about um, is that you would slow your metabolism down. So anytime you stop eating, your body's going to protect itself by slowing metabolism down. You know, your thyroid would slow down a little, metabolism down a little bit. And uh, the problem is when you go, so then you'd burn less calories as a baseline. And then as soon as you went back to your regular diet, you'd blow back up. That's why people yo-yo is because they've slowed their metabolism down. When they return to their previous calorie level, they, they don't have the metabolism to burn it. So they just pack on weight. And it's really not a good thing to do. I think a person, if they're going to juice fast, basically just skip meals once in a while. Just, just you know, if, if you wanted to lose a few pounds, you have to exercise, of course, and keep your body cleansed. Uh, but just skip, skip a meal here and there, and you'll, you'll drop weight, you know, guaranteed, without slowing your metabolism down too much. Okay, this last question is from Rhonda in Vienna, Virginia. 
She says, how do I know which types of detox are healthy? And by the way, Rhonda, I used to live in Vienna, Virginia. She said, how can I know which types of detox are healthy and which types are a sales pitch? <laughs> you know, they're all kind of a sales pitch no matter what. So, so you, you, what you, cause they're selling you something, they're selling you their juice or their, their whatever. So, um, but the, so if you go back to the basics that like we call the general principles of health building, you want to firmly support your body's own detoxification systems first, you know, before you start getting fancy with it, like the celery fast or something like that. Um, there, there's all these other drinks you can, do that would stimulate the liver and there's lots of uh, liver gallbladder flushes and things that would quote unquote detoxify you there's sauna baths that detoxifies the skin and you release things but if you look at the basic uh, detoxifying organs which probably starts with the liver you know it's con considered the grandfather organ in Chinese medicine and it detoxifies a lot of stuff anything coming off of the digestive system for instance uh, the liver gets most of its blood supply from enterohepatic circulation, in other words, just what's coming off the guts, and uh, it gets some other blood supply. But it, it's a big detoxifying organ, and it works in miraculous ways. And, uh, and it lets some good things through into your bloodstream, some nutrition and what have you, purified hormones and all these things. So you got to take care of your liver. There's lots of information on that. Um, and, and again, in our dress guide, we touch on the, the liver, supporting the liver. Um, but you have other detoxifying organs. Believe it or not, the colon itself is a detoxifying organ. And it will sequester and excrete toxins out of your body. Um, the skin is a detoxifying organ, considered the largest, largest organ in your body. Uh, the lymph system. And uh, by the way, the lymph system, it's all throughout, you know, you have your lymph nodes here and in your groin and in your arms and all these places that might swell up if you have an infection. Uh, you got to keep your lymph system clean, which requires exercise. There's no circulatory system of its own. There's no pump. Like the heart, you know, has a pump. The, the circulatory system has a pump. The lymph system has no pump. And uh, so you have to move your body to cleanse your lymph. And the lungs, believe it or not, the lungs are a detoxifying organ. How so? Well, they take in oxygen, but they excrete carbon dioxide, which is a toxin and a poison. You know, it's very, um, it's very um, pro-oxidative. So you want to get rid of your, you know, your um, carbon dioxide. So you have the skin, you have the lungs, you have the kidneys, and of course you have the, uh, or the liver, and of course you have the kidneys, and the colon, as I said, and you want to keep all these things really clean. That's your best detoxification program right there. Keep those things clean. And then if you happen to find that you're exposed to some additional environmental toxins, or if you, you know, got some bugs, uh, some living organisms that are, that are excreting toxins in your body, and of course our bodies have produced their own toxins anyway through normal metabolic processes, so you can do a few extra things like stay really well hydrated and enhance function of some of these organs. That's my best bet. But otherwise, it's almost all a sales pitch to me. Great. Well, thank you so much, Reed, for coming on. And if you want to go and find out more information about Reed Davis, if you go to bonesandhormones.com and you can go on his site and get that free report that he was talking about. We will add that dress for health success um, into the show notes today. And if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at chantalrayway.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Reed. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.